This conference will now be recorded. Awesome. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to another EcoPulse Live seminar series. I'm Emily Lamachi. I'm co-lead of the seminar series with Deanna Crowther. This seminar is part of NOAA's EcoPosi biannual seminar series focused on ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and application of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since 1986, this seminar has provided an opportunity to uh, discuss and provoke conversations on subjects pertaining to physical and fisheries oceanography and regional issues in Alaska marine ecosystems. You can visit the EcoFoci webpage for more information. And we sincerely thank you for joining us today as we're transitioning for a hybrid online and in-person seminar. So thanks to everyone both um, here in the room and at and home or in your offices. Um, you can look for our speaker lineup on the One NOAA seminar series or on the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. And if you miss a seminar, you can catch up on PMEL's YouTube page. It takes a few weeks to get them posted, but the seminars will be posted. Um, I ask that you please make sure that your microphones are muted and your videos stay off um, throughout the talks. I'm excited to introduce our two speakers. We have Rob Surian and Dave Kimmel. And these presentations will cover ecosystem-based management in the Alaska Fisheries Science Center from how ecosystem data is being collected to how it is being used. And our first speaker is Robert Surian. He's the program manager for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center uh, and specializes in integrated ecosystem studies to understand population and community dynamics in response to changing food availability and ocean climate. Um, and then after his talk, we'll have time for short questions before we transition to our second speaker. Um, go ahead, Rob. Great, thanks, Emily. And thanks, Deanna, for organizing this. And I appreciate the invitation. So I'm going to focus on the uh, part of eco foci and part of the ecosystem um, studies at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Of course, there's lots of people contributing to ecosystem studies overall, but for today, I'm going to focus on just the Recruitment Process Alliance and um, and kind of what the purpose of it and what what we do within the RPA. So the Recruitment Processes Alliance leads are Libby Lagerwell, who's uh, acting at the moment, and then um, Julie Keister from University of Washington will be um, a, the new hire into that position starting soon, and we're looking forward to that. Ed Farley is also a lead along with Phyllis Stabenow and myself. Okay, and so we're starting these presentations off with our ABT. So here's mine. Right, changing climate affects fish populations and fisheries management needs to respond, but knowing how to respond is challenging. Therefore, we study how climate ecosystem processes affect recruitment of juvenile fish, which are a primary driver of population change. Okay, so what is the RPA? It's, the, it's four AFSC programs, large vessel surveys off, and that are offshore. So the primary programs for this effort are the recruitment processes, um, FOSI at, in Seattle, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, uh, the recruitment energetics and coastal assessment here in Juneau, and then ecosystem, ecosystem monitoring assessment also in Juneau. And these cruises are different from other cruises that AFSC conducts because we um, collect a wide range of data on um, all ecosystem components from physics to whales. Um, and so this includes physical oceanography, water chemistry, phytoplankton, zooplankton. We focus primarily on juvenile fish and crab. Um, so the other surveys such as the bottom trawl surveys and others are focusing on the adult life stages. We're focusing primarily on the juveniles, um, at least for ground fish, but there are exceptions. Um, forage fishes, all life stages, and then also marine birds and mammals. Um, but wait, there's more to, to this whole effort because we have a lot of collaborators that we work with. 
So part of the RPA is also these collaborations and some of our programs also focus on coastal and nearshore studies and these very strong partnerships within the AFSC and, and outside of AFSC. So we have, as far as collaborations throughout AFSC, pretty much every program we have some type of collaboration with, but it, especially we work closely with the Fish Behavioral Ecology Program in Newport and also the Shellfish Assessment Program in Kodiak. Um, the RPA has been a key player and a lead to each of the integrated ecosystem research programs that have occurred so far in Alaska, including the Bering Sea, and the Gulf of Alaska, and those Arctic integrated ecosystem studies. Um, those are primarily funded by North Pacific Research Board, but also uh, collaborative funding with NSF and also collaborative research with NSF and BOLM. And then we also um, are the lead for the Gulf Watch Alaska Long-Term Ecosystem Research and Monitoring Program. So as opposed to those previous programs I mentioned, those are generally in the five-year um, timeframe for those integrated ecosystem research programs. The Gulf Watch Alaska has been ongoing for 10 years now, um, including though a lot of data sets that were collected actually as part of the GOA integrated ecosystem research program and prior oil spill related studies. Um, so some of those time series are dated back to um, decades and actually GAC-1 is now 50 years, a little over 50 years old. Um, but the RPA leads this effort and we just got funding for another five years. So we'll be going to a full 15 years. We're hoping to make it to 20, but that's uncertain at the moment. Um, but it's led by um, people within the RPA, but it's the primary um, investigators involved in these studies are non-government and non-NOAA government collaborators. So There's actually relatively few NOAA people, but we actually use a lot of the data coming from Gulf Watch Alaska for, um, for purposes related to our, the RPA and NOAA's mission. Okay, so uh, along with those specific studies that I mentioned, there's a, uh, those have their own set of surveys and cruises, but the RPA manages a suite of annual or biennial cruises. Um, and those include, for the Arctic, the Distributed Biological Observatory, and then the, those maps shown here are the surveys that were conducted for 2022 in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska that were RPA-led. Um, um, in the Bering Sea, there's the Northern Bering Sea Survey, which is uh, annual, along with the DBO survey. The Southeast Bering Sea is uh, every other year during even years. And then there's the 70-meter isobath, which is uh, both uh, mooring uh, maintenance and replacement, and then also sampling um, for um, along the 70 um, 70 meter ice bath in the Bering Sea, and that's two cruises per year, but they're pretty short, so spring and fall. And then in the Gulf of Alaska, there's the Western Gulf of Alaska survey in the odd years and Southeast Coastal Monitoring, which is annual in Southeast Alaska. And then some of those other, um, okay. so, sorry, was there a question? Oh, okay. And then some of the other, um, surveys that are shown there on a the map that occurred this year, which is an off year for the Gulf of Alaska for RPA surveys, are the um, surveys conducted by the um, Gulf Watch Alaska, which are annual, and then also the uh, near shore beach seine surveys for juvenile fish, primarily Pacific Cod and uh, Pollock, and then also the Southeast Coastal Monitoring, which is an annual survey. So the RPA vision and mission, Overall, the vision of the RPA is to advance the mission of NOAA fisheries through ecosystem monitoring and process studies and improve understanding and forecasting of ecosystem and fisheries dynamics. And then we apply that understanding to management of living marine resources and all of Alaska's LMEs. And then our, the mission, how we accomplish that vision is to uh, use observations from seasonal and biennial fisheries, oceanographic research and monitoring surveys laboratory experiments and modeling to determine the impact of climate on ecosystem dynamics and fisheries outcomes. So we kind of look at the RPA kind of operating as the pyramid um, here, where we have at the base of the pyramid really are these long-term moored observations 
uh, cruise surveys and time series that we um, cultivate. Process-oriented research on top of that, advanced technologies for novel analytical approaches on top of that to develop a mechanistic understanding and provide advice. And that top of that pyramid, that advice, it funnels into um, all the RPA activities that go into um, actually a wide variety of uh, ecosystem management, but in terms of ecosystem-based fisheries management is through the council process. And these go into the um, more um, ecosystem, large marine ecosystem-based assessments uh, or reports of uh, the ecosystem status reports for um, all of the LMEs. And then also they go into single species um, based stock assessments too, in terms of um, both indirect use of in helping to um, inform outcomes of specific models, but also some direct use being applied um, where they're quantitatively used within a model too. Um, and both have particular value depending on your interests and in, in, um, questions. So these are part of those include risk tables, but also the ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles. So now I'm just gonna mention a few case studies that are related to um, that type of effort. And this is a situation where um, there's, again, lots of data that are collected on the, um, the ecosystem and the ocean conditions that, and many of those might be indirect assessments of, is it a warm year, cold year, et cetera. Um, but th these are some examples of where we take a variety of those data inputs and use them directly to try to get um, for a species of interest um, for, from a management perspective. So a direct application um, and direct measurements of this, the species of interest. Um, so here's a good, good, an excellent example of uh, Pacific cod spawning habitat. So this uses data from the Gulf of Alaska one mooring just outside of Resurrection Bay and lots of analysis to show how that relates to water temperatures throughout the Gulf and how broadly applicable using that time series is. Um, and also experimentally derived temperature range for um, hatching success of Pacific cod within, so laboratory experiments to develop a suitable spawning habitat projection um, for a given year. Um, so here's an example on the right that shows that the color codes of hatching success probability up to zero, from 0 to 0 0.5, depth along the y-axis, and then month along the x-axis. So it gives you where you see yellow, <laughs> you see um, uh, better spawning um, probability, better or, or hatching success probability. So as far as the Pacific cod spawning habitat, and you can see in 2015 and 16, there was a lot of really poor uh, spawning um, and hatch success probability for Pacific cod. Um, but in recent years, promising that there's some improvement, which is good to see for 2021 and 2022. Here is another example where of direct use. Um, and this is a, what, two of our surveys, uh, the um, Southeast Coastal Monitoring and the Northern Bering Sea Survey are strong partnerships and couldn't be completed without the partnership of, with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So some of that, the focus, it's a, you know, a standard RPA ecosystem study or survey, but it, a lot of this focus is also on salmon for the state of Alaska. And so here's an example of in Southeast Coastal Monitoring where a catch per unit effort and temperature is used to for pink salmon forecast models. And um, you can see the relationship on the left of the model and then the, heart, the forecasts on the right. And the industry and salmon fisheries managers are very much interested in getting this annual um, forecast for the following year. So you can see the one for 2023. And you can see how well that forecast does in most years. Um, and then on the right is an example of um, this with the graph shown are for Chinook, but um, it's a both um, separately conducted Chinook and Chum salmon forecasts for the Yukon River. And uh, this is using a catch per unit effort or estimates of juvenile abundance um, and then projections for future returns for um, Chinook salmon in the Yukon River. And you can see there's a fairly, um, a very good relationship and good projections from those uh, models. 
Here's another example of um, a contribution that's related that the Recruitment Processes Alliance helps to facilitate, but is primarily conducted by our collaborators with Gulf Watch Alaska and the US Geological Survey. So this is some work that Yumi Ariamitsu and Scott Hatch and others, where they're collecting um, juvenile sablefish from the diet or from seabirds. So this is, here's rhinoceros auklets and showing foraging trips for auklets and kitty wakes from Middleton Island. So they're out sampling fish and throughout this region in the northeastern Gulf of Alaska. And from collections by the birds brought back to the colony and, and then preserved for analysis, um, you can um, see the relative growth or size at a particular um, date um, for the summertime of juvenile sablefish. So here's a plot now that Yumi has made for the length anomaly for estimated size on July 24th. And you can see it varies considerably uh, between warm and cold years. And a good example of um, what how different this can be is in 2020 and 2021, shown in the picture here, uh, the very dra dramatically different sizes of the two fish. So this isn't a, this is information is being used as part of the sablefish um, ESP, um, but it, and it's still under development. And that's the case for a lot of these. Um, they're constantly being refined and developed. And then here's an example of uh, juvenile pollock energy density versus recruitment. So this was some work that was initiated by Ron Hines and Yvette Sidden with the, um, in the Bering Sea, showing, um, again, trying to forecast based on energy content of juvenile fish, what age one recruitment's gonna look like in the future. And it's interesting because when this was initially um, analyzed in one of the earlier publications, there was a pretty strong relationship uh, with just out considering warm and cold years. But as they collected more data, you'd see there's kind of different relationships between warm and cold years. And then collecting more data, there's outliers. And in some respects, you kind of frustrating that you have outliers and your relationship might not be quite as strong. But in, in other respects, those outliers are super interesting from a process perspective. So there's a lot that we can learn from those, um, um, from the outliers. And also it's highlighting the fact that these relationships are not stationary. We would expect them to change over time. And especially given the, the way our, um, the climate is changing in, in Alaska, as shown here in terms of September ice coverage in Chukchi Sea, the um, occurrence of heat waves and the increased frequency in the Gulf of Alaska, there is no reason to believe these relationships should be um, stationary, and we need to continue to evaluate uh, the work and these um, that we're doing and continuing these long-term monitoring efforts and um, and process-focused research. So, as far as our overall focus and direction, uh, just. In summary, the RPA and all of the ecosystem programs at the Alaska Fishery Science Center provide the why. Why are populations increasing or declining? Why are fish in poor condition? And for example, why are high algal booms occurring? Again, we're constantly evaluating and re-evaluating the processes because those allow us the mechanistic understandings to actually make projections and understand what the future might look like in the near term and the long term. But we're also adaptive too. So constantly adding new sampling platforms, one of which Dave's gonna talk about and to provide um, data more, um, in a more timely manner and as soon as possible and automate some of these processes, but also adding gear too. So for example, we, uh, a small mesh beam trawl has been added to the surveys in the uh, Bering Sea this year, the, both the Southeast Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea. And those, um, those actually cruises in particular have an enormous demand for samples. They're very highly um, sought after for lots of researchers within AFSC and outside of ASC. And it's become quite challenging to um, coordinate all the data requests for, and, um, for those cruises. And then also the, the goal here is to contribute to both, uh, you know, tell, describe what, what has happened, but also provide some early warnings and also forecasting like some of those examples I showed. 
And just to end with a huge thank you, because this is a, a massive effort from many people, um, AFSC and PMEL leadership for supporting this. Um, all the PIs that are involved in developing, designing studies, analyzing data, the science and vessel crews and laboratory staff, which are too numerous to list, but it, critical to this effort. Um, and then also, of course, the, the cruises are no simple task either, but the logistics and the administrative staff to make those happen too. All right, that's it, thank you. Thank you, and we have time for questions for Rob. Uh, Sir, if there's anyone online, you can enter them into the chat. And do we have any questions from the room? Well, thanks for sharing the, uh, the different examples. And do you have any comments on uh, specific priorities or projects coming down the pipeline that you're most excited about? Oh, thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah, I guess there's uh, quite a few projects that um, are kind of under development and kind of exploratory. And I think there's a couple that I think are particularly interesting and exciting and i think and some of that is for like i mentioned with the the work with the small mesh beam trawl and the kind of pelagic benthic coupling work in the northern bering sea and southeast bering sea that transition is one of the kind of priority areas that we think is important for study and um, so i think some of the work coming out of that um, is particularly interesting. I think some of the work that you're going to see next from Dave is super exciting in terms of there's like, as I mentioned, the effort to make these data as, um, you know, to provide data as rapidly as possible as soon as a survey is completed. And that has been um, a, it's, we've been pretty successful to that, but it's, there's um, also, um, a lot of work to be done there. Um, so yeah, I would say what Dave's going to present is super exciting and kind of shows where we're going with some of this effort. Um, there was also a question about the juvenile energy density. So there's a couple different ways that we, actually about three different ways that we good at that. <clears throat> so one way, and the the, um, the example I showed was um, from bomb calorimeter calorimetry, so just uh, kilojoules per gram on um, in wet mass, but we can also convert to dry mass uh, basis. Um, we also use um, a sulfur phospho vanillin SPV method, which is a calorimic, and, um, and it looks at, um, that's a more rapid assessment and much cheaper to do because it is, uh, it's simple and faster. And that's another one of those methods that we can produce results within a week after a cruise versus um, sometimes months. Um, and then there's also more of the uh, proximate composition looking at different lipids within the, um, within the organism. And that's even more involved, but also that's that more detailed lipid information, energy information provides answers to specific questions. So we use a combination of all those uh, between working at, with the lab here at, uh, in New, or in, um, Juno, but also with the Luis Copeman in the Newport lab. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll stop sharing. All right, our next speaker is Dave Kimmel. Dave is a lead research oceanographer at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. His area of expertise is biological oceanography, zooplankton ecology, coastal ecology climate impacts on ecosystems, and qualitative ecology. Greetings, virtual audience. Okay. This is the pointer, which is, does this work on the screen? Mm -hmm. oh, it does. Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you disembodied voice. Okay, 
Um, greetings, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you. I'm going to essentially give you the talk I gave to Pisces uh, meeting recently. And um, what I'm going to talk about is how to automate a rapid zooplankton assessment for use in ecosystem based fisheries management. And I want to acknowledge uh, my co authors here, Deanna Krauser, uh, who works as part of the zooplankton team, has been working side by side with me to get this thing off the ground. And then our colleagues in Poland that have been generating a very large annotated in image data set for us. And then my colleague Hong Shen B, who's been working to help us with the um, AI portion of this that you're going to see today. So I uh, just want to acknowledge those folks. Um, uh, and uh, here's my ABT, um, which is that zooplankton are very important, critical ecosystem components because they connect our primary producers phytoplankton to higher trophic levels. In other words, they're the gateway between all of the energy that's fixed in the, in the bottom of the food web. Um, and they're important indicators of ecosystem status that are used in management. But the problem is that traditional sampling requires significant time and expertise to generate these data. Therefore, we need new methods of assessment that are required, or new methods of assessment are required to ensure managers receive timely information on zooplankton or, um, you know, I'm out of a job. So, uh, what I want to talk to you about today uh, is the zooplankton information to fisheries management and why that's a problem. Oh, I can see that. Uh, rapid zooplankton assessment is what was the solution that was designed before I sort of joined uh, EcoFoci, and we've been working to assess this, figure out if it works and, and how it can be used in management, and then um, figure out if we can automate this approach, uh, which is our work in progress, and then uh, some future work and some parting thoughts on sort of where this, uh, this is headed. So fisheries management in Alaska, as Rob sort of alluded to, uh, is a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of jobs in the seafood industry. There's a lot of money at stake, and it exists on an annual cycle. So the annual cycle, as sort of Rob gave a beautiful introduction, is all of this information is coming in uh, from ecosystem models, survey data, uh, all these different information is then being funneled down into this plan team, there's a review, and at the end, we get this management outcome, which is the total allowable catch for the fishery. Um, and so what you have to understand is it's, it's a huge funnel. There's a lot of information going in there. But the key thing to remember here is it's an annual cycle, which is going to be a problem for us zooplankton folks, as you'll see in a second. That's because we have a very large footprint. Um, we're talking about very large marine ecosystems that we're responsible for. That's five. Um, that requires a lot of vessels, a lot of sampling. And as, law, as Rob told you, we have in-situ data, survey data, laboratory data, time series, maps, energetics. All this stuff has to go into these reports, and it has to be done on that annual cycle. Otherwise, it's old news for next year. And so if you're a, a, a zooplankton person, that's bad because you have a lot of samples, but you need time to process those samples. You need experts to count them, to go through them, identify the species, and that takes a lot of time. So the data were not being applied to fishery management during the annual cycle. And that became a problem because we're, you know, we know this information is really important. Um, but we had a problem, you know, we collecting, sometimes we get 1,500 jars and we send them to our colleagues in Poland and they sort and identify them and the data comes back and we check it and make sure it's okay. And then um, we put it into our database and we start to do some analyses and it's next year. Then what? So the solution was, or, or the problem was collecting the zooplankton data are easy, turning it into meaningful data is quite difficult. Um, so it requires significant expertise and time, and unfortunately, taxonomy is not exactly a growing field, uh, which is personally a tragedy, I believe, but um, that's one man's opinion. Uh, but the solution we came up with is, why don't we try a rapid sort on board the ship, approximate the standing stock of the important groups that we know relate directly to fish that they're feeding upon, we provide that information in the form of uh, a rapid zooplankton count. So the way we do that is uh, we collect a regular uh, sample. Where is it? Ah, here we go. 
So we collect a regular neck sample and we filter that down into a jar. One of these jars goes to Poland to be eventually counted. The other one, aboard the ship, we take some subsamples and we start to count the large copepods, and you can see them here, calamus, neocalamus. We count the small guys, you know, little fish got E2, pseudocalamus, acarcia, athona, and then euphalces. And this information is then put into these large course categories, and we can summarize that um, uh, for, sorry, the back of it. We can summarize that information, and then what we can do is we can compare it to the actual counts that we do. And so I did that using, a, and I'm in the middle of this analysis, but I did a Bayesian analysis. It was a simple analysis to act. If I take the RZA and I predict the actual eventual abundance, and can I do that um, effectively? And the answer is when I fit a bunch of different models and the base model is basically just, can the RZA predict the predicted uh, final count? The answer is, yeah, it sure can. Um, and that is this base model here, down here. And you can see the R squared is about 0.6, pretty good for ecological data. Um, then I asked the question, well, does it vary by large marine ecosystem? Does it vary when you add in a different season, or does it vary by who's do, who is doing the sorting? And the answer is that basically the best model is when you account for the sorter. And that's because, believe it or not, it is expertise when you go and count these things. So, um, however, even if you account for that uh, and, and you recognize that some people are better at it than others, in general, this works really well. Okay, so it matches our accounts. And I'm even um, more uh, bullish about this because my colleagues in Canada on DFO did this on their cruises this year, and they're producing the same results. Okay, so this is a, a viable tool that we can use. It produces information that matches what our eventual counts get, and it's usable for ecosystem management. And how do we use it for ecosystem management? Well, each year we produce a map and we say, okay, here's the distribution of the large, the small, and the euphalces. And then we can put that into our time series over here. This is weird. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, anyway, uh, we, can, we can do it over here. And you can see that for the black dots, which are the counted samples that eventually come from Poland, and the blue triangles, which are the RCA, that these match up pretty good. You have some euphalcid problems here and there because uh, we tend to get boom and bust with euphalcids when it comes to whether we get them in the net. But for the most part, they, these data match up very well. So we think, first and foremost, we have a viable tool. But the second question is, why in the world do we want to automate this? And um, I like to call upon uh, legends, and this is the legend of, of John Henry, who was a steel driving man. And his job was to pound in these railroad spikes, and he was really good at it. But eventually along came the steam engine. And that led to a, a very big contest, historical contest, where you know, John Henry prevailed, but it cost him his life. I don't mean to be so dramatic and to say that we're going to take all the taxonomists out one day and not use them anymore just to say that eventually automation comes for us all. And so what we wanna do is remove that sorter impact on the RCA. So in other words, we, we do train individuals to go out, but some are better than others. And we know that affects the results a little bit. We wanna reduce the time. Now we do the RCA about every other station. It takes time to do on board, but if we could just take an image, scan that image, count the individuals, identify them, we could do all the stations. Okay, we can get much more information. Also, we want to provide an easy to use tool to produce RCA in the other large marine ecosystems. Unfortunately, zooplankton collection is, is, is it's, it's in peril across a lot of these uh, other fishery science centers because um, it takes a lot of time to collect and process the data. And therefore, I want to sort of rescue this as a tool to help other uh, fishery science centers. And then eventually, we want to take what, what Rob was talking about and provide additional information on size, lipid content for additional context. So we can add more information by, by analyzing these images. So there are a lot of reasons to automate the RZA. So how are we going to automate the RZA? Well, we, we want to turn to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And what we want to do is take a large annotated library we want to annotate those images and we want to train an algorithm to identify those. So we have a great resource in our colleagues in Poland 
So they've kindly set up a microscope in place, and when they're done counting and identifying the samples for us, they image them. And by imaging them, then we can use this commercially available free software called LabelMe. Um, this is extremely tedious, but it's the way to get your algorithm going. You, you draw some polygons around your little animals, and you do this repeatedly. Um, and we produce lots of nice images like this, and then after we're done, we have a large annotated library. Because of the level of tediousness with this, Poland is an amazing partner to do this because they're identifying the individuals, and usually it's just one or two individuals in the lab trying to do this. We have a whole lab that's working with us. So it's a really nice partnership, and they've done an amazing job. The next thing as we do is we develop an algorithm flow, and our algorithm has two particular uh, pathways in it. The first is it detects the background, and this is a sort of small, lightweight uh, neural network, and it basically goes, is it a dark background or a light background? And the reason we do this is that some zooplankton are easier to see on a dark background, some easier to see on a light background. So first it does, detects the background and says, light or dark. That's easy. The next is we need a convolute, convolutional neural network. It's a region-based thing, and it has two steps. First, it says, I need to detect the, the thing I'm pointing at the screen. And I know people at home can't see that, so I'm sorry. We are doing a regional proposal network, and that is to identify the actual targets. Yes, please help me. Uh, there we go. Hold it down. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so region metrics is ROI detection, and that's our regional proposal network, and that basically says what's our target in the image. It's not as easy as you, you it looks easy for the human. You can look at it and go, yeah, that's overplay. Not so easy for the computer. So we have to train the algorithm to do that. And then once it's trained, it will orient these guys, and then it will do a classification based on the residual neural network that we train on all of those images that we've um, done in Poland, okay? And so what we're doing now is we're essentially training up this algorithm and we're testing it. And so I'll show you some results from that. Oh, now it's not advancing. And I'm doing this big technology project. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So here's the results for scene classification. And as you can see, the algorithm is very good at determining whether it's a light or dark background, which is, you know, it's a, it's a small step, but it's very good at it. Sometimes when it's a, it thinks it's a dark background when it's a little bit light. So there's a little bit in there that we need to train. But once we got the, the algorithm going, the success rate was very, very, very high. Not the same for classification. It's much more difficult to classify individuals. So here's our initial training. We were getting after about you know, 20,000 iterations an accuracy rate of about 85% or so uh, in our course categories. And when we increase the iterations, which requires more GPU computing time and more data, we're now getting up into the upper 90s with our course categorization. So it's going pretty well. And this is just for the RZA category, small copepods, large copepods, eufausids, key mass, a couple other things. So it's not a very complex algorithm, but so far it's functioning. So what I'm gonna show you now is how the algorithm looks when it's working. So I'm gonna play you a little video, and the video is going to, okay, can I, what do I do? Let's go over here. I have to go over to, oh, there's a little, I guess you can't click on that. Okay, there. So now it's going, and what you'll see is the algorithm is gonna look at this image and then it's gonna mask these individuals and it's gonna count them. In some cases, it's gonna look really good, and in some cases, it's gonna look not so good. Okay, kind of, there we go. All right, so let's, let's keep an eye on it as we're watching it, and you'll see it'll mask and count the individuals, and it'll get a little spit out at the bottom. It'll tell you the number of individuals that are in there and what category they belong to. That one was pretty good. Um, now we'll switch over to a light one. It has a little more problem with the light one. You see all the different um, bits and pieces in there. See, not so good. Um, and then it, it actually does a little better depending on uh, how many individuals are in it, uh, depending on how many uh, different types of species. You can see I'm using single species images here. Uh, when we mix them up, it does a little worse. Um, 
But this is basically how the algorithm works. And this is designed as a standalone application that we can take to see with us and process the images while we're at sea using a small GPU. Um, uh, these are uh, sea butterflies, Cleone, and you can see that they're very easy to detect. Uh, these are Katie gnats. You can see that they're also fairly easy to detect, at least partially. Um, and so the, the algorithm is working. Um, I'll show you some results on classification and counting. Uh, but overall, we feel like we have a viable start to, to our, uh, our activities here. This is final one and looking pretty decent. All right. So how does it work? Well, the answer is, yeah, okay. Um, in our first iteration, it's pretty good at detecting large copepods, as you might imagine. And it's really good at, at detecting, or I mean, really good at detecting large copepods, not so good at small copepods. It gets a little confused with that size difference, so we have to hone that in. Um, it's pretty good at detecting euphausids and very good at detecting heating mass, but it's not so good at counting, which you'll see over on the right side. It's a bit of a scatter plot, but the, the, the positive thing is that we are moving in the right direction. In other words, that line is going upwards to the right, which is what we want. It's not flat or down. And so the algorithm can be improved to get these counts a little better. And our intention was to have Deanna take a bunch of images from this fall cruise on the, on the Dyson and she got a grand total of four samples before the Dyson crapped out and had to go back to port. So uh, we will be back at this next year and generating images on board the ship and testing mixed images um, to, to increase the algorithm, which is something we'll try over the winter. So um, to conclude, uh, based on our beginning set of training data, we have a viable classifier for the RZA category. So in other words, we can generate RZA data from an image. Okay. Humans right now are better at it, but in general, the algorithm is, is pretty good at, at classifying and being able to de detect the categories that we want, but it's going to require more data. Okay. Uh, the answer to all these AI questions is more data, so annotate and train, annotate and train. So last time I talked to Hong Sheng, which is about a month ago, he said the improvements are now getting better, but they're more slight because the original the classifier itself works, it has to get better with more information. We need to develop a better streamlined image generation at sea. It's not so much fun to try to take an image of a sloshing dish of zooplankton when you're sitting in a microscope at sea. So we need to think of some ways to do better at that. We thought about a flatbed scanner, but also not so great at sea uh, with moving around. Um, so I, I posed this question to folks at the Pisces. There wasn't a lot of ideas, so I'll pose it again here and I'm open to discussion. Um, we are using a microscope, but that does affect our depth of field as well, as well as our magnification. So we need to sort of come up with a, a couple ways to do that. Um, how robust is the algorithm? That's a real key question, because are we over tuning it to the samples we get from our system? Can it be applied to other systems? Um, we plan to add in field generated images. Of course, that's the ultimate test. Uh, but is that going to destroy our algorithm? Will it require more training adjustments for a new algorithm? I, I pain myself to think about whether that will be the case, but um, that is the way this works. And so uh, essentially we will keep throwing data at this and hopefully in the coming year have a real, real world test of whether or not the RZA can be done through image analysis only, which for those of you that do the RZA at C, I can hopefully hear you saying yay so that you don't have to sit in front of the microscope and count all of these small uh, copepods in order to generate this data. And many of you uh, listening online and in the room here have done RCAs over the years. So we thank you very, very much. And I'm done. Um, and this is my cruising with COVID picture uh, from 2020. So 2021. So yes. Thank you. Uh, oh, we have a question from online. Mm -hmm. Why not use an automated imaging system designed for zooplankton? Such as the zoo scan, I'm assuming you're talking about? Uh, yeah, someone else asked, have you considered using a zoo scan? 
Yeah, so the ZoScan is really just a scanner. Um, so we could use that to image the, the zooplankton, but the algorithm itself is basically developed much in the same way. Um, so we chose to do our own algorithm and work on that so we didn't have to spend all the money to buy the ZoScan is essentially uh, the reason. But the, the ZoScan, I, I had one many years ago, uh, and this was before AI was kind of a, a huge thing, and it worked okay, but it required a very large amount of human input to generate the images that were usable by the ZoScan. Maybe the technology has, has changed. Uh, I want this to be take an image as easy as possible, run the algorithm, make it as robust as possible so that as little human intervention is, is needed. If someone has to sit in front of the scanner with the cactus hair, make sure that all the individuals aren't touching and make sure that all the resolution is the right way, it defeats the purpose of what I'm trying to do, so. Very familiar with VPR. Yep, yeah, we have used the VPR. We actually work uh, with some folks that are using the VPR. Um, we have an in-situ camera that we purchased called the CPIX that we're going to be using and have used. We also have a plankton imager that we work with Hong Shang on called the plankton scope that we plan on taking out. So there is a, I didn't talk about it here, but there's a parallel in-situ imaging uh, uh, pathway that we're working on as well. We have a ton of images. We actually, our new program manager, uh, Julie Keister has been working on this as well. She has a camera that's been working out in, in uh, Hood Canal, is that right? the canal to look at uh, differences of zooplankton in, in oxygen zones. So yeah, we're, we're familiar with all of that stuff. Yep. Another question from Elizabeth Phillips. Uh, I'm curious if the vessel has fisheries acoustics, and if so, have you looked into using that data to compare and perhaps complement or supplement your zooplankton abundance and distribution estimates? Yeah, we have. We have an acoustician on staff named uh, Adam Spear who's been looking into this for us. We're actually quite interested in new faucets. So this summer we went out and did some methot trawling and just to look at the, the relationship between acoustic sign and eufalcid abundance. Um, and then we're hoping as AI begins to develop a bit more for the, the acoustic streams that we'll be able to take the acoustic uh, data from the Oscar Dyson and look at the zooplankton signals as well to complement this. So good question. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the room? I have a question. Yeah. From um, just the technical, uh, of it. So were you surprised by the results that it could detect small microbial products in the classification better than, than it did relative to the large No, not surprised at all. Um, the algorithm is, it's sort of predictable. You can sort of tell by the images you give it how well it's going to do by sitting there long enough. You know, even if you go in and label, it's more difficult to label small microbial products. So I'm struggling at it. So the algorithm itself is probably going to do the same. Uh, the question then is, you know, as you shift magnifications around, how good is it at detecting small versus large if you keep the magnification the same? Uh, so there's a lot of, there's subtle nuances in it. And, and so what I'm trying to do is create an algorithm that is as robust as humanly possible. Whatever you throw at it, it's going to go, oh yeah, that's, that's what I'm supposed to be looking at and counting. And you don't have to, you know, put in a lot of, I, I want this to be truly automatic. In other words, I don't want it to be uh, require a lot of front end work by the individual to get the image just right. I want you know put the slop slop the subsample under the the whatever imager you have, take an image, move on. So that's the hope anyway. But I don't know if we're there yet. We have one uh, chat uh, chat question from Michael. Can you please go into more detail of how this data is used? For example, are the estimates of copepods used to inform recruitment of fish species and stock assessment models? So yes, yeah, some information is used. It goes into stock assessment models. For example, the large copepod calanus in the bearing can be used as a predictor for walleye pollock uh, age three populations. So Lisa Eisner has published a paper on that. Um, so they go in there. They also go in risk tables. For example, during the warm years in the Gulf of Alaska, we had very low zooplankton abundances during our spring surveys, and that was a bit of an alarm bell. And it went into the risk table, and they actually used it to reduce catch for some of the walleye pollock and other species based on system-wide productivity. So yeah, they are used. Um, as far as recruitment models, you know, they, they were used in the past. And for example, in, in the Gulf, walleye pollock recruitment has kind of shifted away from, 
from the from the larvae over to sort of a, a, a predation switch. Um, so it's it's not as viable, but you know the system's changing. So I think we'll we'll have to revisit that. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Overlap. Oh, overlapping specimens. Yeah, they overlap all the time, and the algorithm uh, can deal with that. It's actually good. It, it once it learns how to detect, it can detect overlapping things. Um, it's a bit more of a problem, but it's like I was talking about with with the zoscan. You know, if, if the organisms can't touch, it's a lot of time. Then you got to put in the individuals in there. You got to separate out the speed. You know, the differences. You got to. So we said we need an algorithm that's more robust than that. And this algorithm that we've been using is it's actually very good for not only. Um, sort of microscope images, but for benthic cameras, um, for acoustic data, it works really well, this algorithm. But yeah, no problem with organisms touching so far. Sometimes it segments the same organism into two organisms. That's a problem. But. Anything else on there? How much data do you typically collect a season and at the rate of the models improving? Do you have an outlook for uh, getting to the point that you want to be at? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the, the annotated data set we're producing, Poland is helping us to the tune of about 4,000 individual images a year that contain multiple individuals. Um, and then somebody has to label them. That somebody so far has been me. So <laughs> my capacity is somewhat limited, but um, I think in our next agreement, we'll talk about having uh, our Polish colleagues help us label the images as well. In that case, I'm hoping once we have all the uh, field images from this year, let's say we generate a couple hundred RCA images this year, coming year, and we use that in the training, I'm thinking by next year, we could hopefully have an algorithm that's Semi ready for prime time. If Julie Keister is listening, don't put that in my performance plan, please. Awesome. We have time for um, one last question. If anyone wants to jump in the chat or the room. Oh, we got one from the chat. Can you tie the abundance counts to satellite data, which is ocean color? I've seen people attempt that over the years, and I have yet to be convinced that it is possible. I've seen some work that looked at uh, broad scale satellite imagery related to CPR counts and other things. So far, I'm not convinced is the best way to put it, but I haven't tried it myself. Oh, uh, and Julie commented. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Let's uh, give a round of applause for both of our speakers today. And then we'll see you back next week for another Equal seminar that will be our last one this season. We're done. Thank you. Thanks.